Hi there, welcome to another segment uh, introducing Supernoetics. This one's called Data Evaluation. Now that might sound a bit stuffy, you know, like computers checking their databases or, you know, in banks, uh, documents and forms and things. No, it's nothing like that. It's really about what we know, how we know what we know, and how do we know it's true. So, quite an important topic, I'm sure you'll agree. Let's start with a couple of cute quotes. First of all, George Bernard Shaw, he's always good. Beware of false knowledge. It's more dangerous than ignorance, he says. And what about Mark Twain? Always witty. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> that actually gets you into trouble. The trouble is it starts in childhood. It affects people all their lives. It's to do with education and schooling. Schools have a very, very poor definition of learning, which is remembering. That's all they ask you to do, is just remember something. It doesn't even matter if you understand it. It doesn't matter if it's useless or worthless. You just have to remember it. And of course, a test of memory is certainly not a test of understanding. Uh, you can remember stuff that's wrong, and you, you can pass the exams, and you can do well at school. But if the knowledge is worthless or just plain wrong, and quite a lot of school knowledge is just that, then it becomes a very destructive, self-perpetuating system. In my supernoetics, one of the very first things that we do is look at this subject of learning and education and uh, heal education. I use the word healing, you know, I'm an MD. And it needs healing. It's sick and poisonous and cancerous and ruins kids' lives. And of course, it ruins adults' lives too, because it's basically a bunch of crap, worthless crap. Learning is only a valuable uh, if it's applicable to life. You know, it's not. It's nothing to do with getting school grades. And I've heard it wittily said that basically the schooling system is to teach people to be college professors. Well, you know, less than a half of one percent of people would ever dream of being a college professor. So the rest of people are being shortchanged by this very narrow track, with no escape. You know, you have to go straight down from start to finish. And you come out the other end, well, <laughs> you know, you can see the results. You only have to look around you and see the results of the education system. You know, all the uh, unemployment, the failures, the murder, crime, marriages, cruelty, divorce, rape, war, you know, anything negative you want to name. That's basically the real advertisement and the real outcome of the educational system. Uh, as I said, memorizing is not so important, but learning to judge and evaluate what it is that you're being exposed to, what appears to be some facts or information coming your way. How do you judge? And judgment, this critical evaluation thing is very important, and kids are not taught it. Anyway, we're going to teach you a little bit about it here. Remember, as I'm saying all the way through with supernoetics, you can, I can only give you a glimpse of you know, parts of this, I hope an exciting glimpse, and more to the point, I can tell you something extremely valuable in a short space of time, but you know, you need to come at it many different ways and gradually over time develop the skills and abilities. But there are four basic data types that I've isolated for this segment. First of all, facts. We think we know what a fact is, let's just leave it at that for the moment, but so-called facts. There are beliefs. That's data and information for which there's no proof, but you accept it. You know, I believe that to be the case. That's okay, as long as you're aware that it is only a belief. There's something that I call hoaxes. There's a special definition for that. It's one of those, you know, everybody knows that kind of thing, but it's wrong, like Mark Twain was saying, it ain't so. And then the evaluation of importances, okay? It depends on where you're getting your data information from. But if the source is a pretty crappy, unreliable source, then the data is a crappy and unreliable, or you know, to a degree, in fact, relatively worthless. So let's start looking at these. First of all, facts. We, as I say, we think we know what a fact is, but it's tricky because a lot of facts, like you know, the Earth is flat, later turn out to be not facts at all. They're passed around as facts, and people accept them and believe them to be true. So. To improve on this, in supernoetics, we bring in the concept of data that has been evaluated. Now, to evaluate something means to judge it and test its worth. 
And to give you an example of what I mean, I'm going, I'm going to share with you a famous historic story. Everyone's heard of Einstein's theory of relativity, even if they don't understand it. It's said to be very hard to understand. I'm not sure if that's true. It's hard to understand if you just believe in the old-fashioned physics, but you know, if you're flexible, it's, you know, in its own terms, it's not that tricky. But remember, it was just a theory. Einstein proposed this theory, brilliant theory, but that's all it was. It really rested on being evaluated or tested and proven, if you like, and in this case, there was a famous moment when there was an eclipse of the sun that was photographed in 1918 from the island of Principe in the Pacific Ocean. Now, what was interesting is that you know the, the next chance to test the theory was about 20,000 years into the future. I can't remember the ex you know, but long, long, long into the future. But almost within you know just a few years of when he wrote his theory of relativity, the chance came up to test it. Uh, somebody went to, I think Sir Arthur Eddington actually went to Principe and actually took the photograph and a famous telegraph, uh, telegram shot around the world. Yes, it's true, the proof, Einstein was correct, relativity is all on. So it was transformed from being, uh, you know, a maybe or a hypothesis into a true fact. That's what we mean by evaluation, okay? On a personal level, it's harder, but the important thing for me and the important thing we teach is that on a personal level, you've got to evaluate things from your own experience. You know, if someone says to you, listen, this is, it's totally true, blondes are all gold diggers, you've got to test that from your own experience. And if you find a blonde who's a, you know, she's clearly a gold digger, or you read about her in the newspaper, that makes it possible. But then what if you may meet another 50 blondes that are clearly not gold diggers, they're nice girls, they're not on the make for anything, uh, you know, the theory collapses. So your own personal evaluation from your own personal experience is something that we value above all else in supernoetics. And we have this saying, it derives from one of Buddha, I'll share with you in a minute, which is that if it's true for you, then it's true, right? Doesn't matter whether it's true for others. There's a slight corollary or rider to that. And it's, if it's true for others that you trust or a source that you trust, then it's relatively true. Okay, so, you know, if this person usually gets it right, listen to what they say, and probably it's good. But you still would be better to evaluate it for yourself. And if you find that it's true, you find it works in your life, you find it gets you the results and outcomes that you like and that you're looking for, then it's true for you. Okay? This is very revolutionary, of course. In schools, we're taught that it's true if I tell you it's true, and if you don't damn well learn it, you stay after class. Uh, that's a very poor standard, as I said. Uh, you must bear in mind Buddha's admonition. It's, uh, it's wonderful, really. It says, believe nothing, no matter where it came from, even if I said it, unless it agrees with your own common sense and your experience and your own reason. And to me, that is the absolute gold benchmark of learning and education. You can't do any better than that in either the educational domain, the psychological domain, or most important to us of all, of course, the spiritual domain, whatever is to do with spirit and the greater life, the higher life. Our truths are very precious to us in that domain, okay? All right, let's move on to authority statements. This is something you've got to be on your guard against. I mean, arbitraries, you might call them. You know, it's that way because Professor Blogger Wazer of Bloggerboo University said it's true, so it must be true, and it was produced in the, you know, Bloggo Science Journal. In 1956, therefore it's true. You've got to get rid of all that kind of stuff, right? But unfortunately, kids are force-fed this crap night and day. You know, they're punished for not memorizing it. They're punished for trying to think different. They're punished for getting bored and thinking, this is a lot of bunk. I don't even want to listen. <laughs> you know, that child will get an infraction. What's really happening is that the educational system is giving children the scientific, social, and political dogmas of the day. They're not fed facts really are no meaningful or useful facts anyway. And then you've got to watch this authority thing, you know, so-called, you know, experts, so-and-so said it, so it must be true, you know, like Stephen Hawking is famous in cosmology and astronomy, you know, he's so clever, I've heard him described as a genius. I think the man's an idiot because he believes in a completely junk theory that's been long dead, you know, for over two, three decades it's been dead. 
he keeps on peddling it because that's what made him famous and he's not interested in the truth he's interested in Richard uh, Stephen Hawking sorry going I almost said Richard Dawkins then he's interested in Stephen Hawking going on being famous and there's a famous saying actually you know the, the people like this hold back progress you see there's a famous saying that you can tell the importance of fame of a man by how long he holds back progress in his field and it's perfect and you know Dawking is a cracking example of that this big bang theory that he espouses and a lot of other people too of course it's been dead since 1988 famous paper was published in the major scientific journal Nature. The title of the, the paper, The Big Bang is Dead. It exposed so many weaknesses and loopholes in the theory that it couldn't possibly be true. It, they weren't saying, look, we're missing evidence. What they said is there is evidence that it can't be true. But they still hang on to this. It rests on obscure math. You know, it's never made a single prediction. Now, that's the important thing in science and hypothesis. And this is the, the important thing in your learning and education, right? You learn something or I teach you something in supernatics. It will predict that if you go out and do so-and-so, you will get X, Y, Z result. And if you can't make predictions, it's not science and it's not true until you can. The, the Big Bang hypothesis has not made a single prediction of anything that's true. For example, they come up with this supposed dark matter. There isn't any dark matter. Nobody's seen it. It can't be found. It doesn't exist. But they're saying, well, it must be out there because if it wasn't, our theory would be wrong. And of course, their theory is wrong because there isn't any dark matter. And instead, they're dragging on decade after day, decade thinking, well, it's going to turn up. No, it isn't because it's not there. It's all based on obscure math. And that's the way modern science goes, I'm afraid. It's really become a belief system. And the Big Bang is a belief system. It's not science. There isn't any proof whatsoever that this silly model is true. And, you know, they never ask the important questions, of course, like, well, what, what happened before the Big Bang? You know, it all started from a singularity. You've got all this something from nothing, and then eventually everything from nothing, and they can't say how that came about. They just say, well, it did come about because our maths say so. And it's twisted maths at that. So anyway, that brings up the subject of beliefs. And of course, we all know what beliefs are. It's something that we accept without evidence or proof. That's okay, so long as you understand that it is a belief. If scientists thought, well, you know, the Big Bang's a good idea, I like to believe in it. But if any evidence comes along, of course, it's only a belief, so I'll dump it. They just fight the evidence, <laughs> you know, and say, well, the evidence must be wrong. Our belief can't be wrong, it must be the evidence. You know, I'm talking about hard evidence, you know, like, for example, you know, I don't want to get technical. But, you know, the predictions made the universe 40 orders of magnitude too flat. I'm not talking about one order or two orders, which would certainly blow it out of the court. Three orders would absolutely disprove it. I'm talking 40 orders of magnitude too flat, okay? But the big danger really is not stubbornness and idiocy. It's hidden beliefs. You know, you can't spot that they're beliefs. You've accepted them as true. Like, you know, junior scientists have probably accepted the Big Bang as an invisible belief. It's, well, of course it's true. Everybody knows it's true. And it's gone into their data set and they've never questioned it. Of course, the people in time before that are the ones that uh, didn't apply the proper gating process to what knowledge is valuable and what knowledge is just beliefs. All right, let's move on to something I call hoaxes. It's a bit like what I just said in a way, but hoaxes, it's just a term I made up, or I didn't make the word up, but I link it to this concept, you know, those everybody knows. And, uh, you know, everybody knows that heavier-than-air machines can't fly. You know, everybody knows the Earth is flat. And all these things, sooner or later, turn out to be wrong. They were never true, even when everybody knew that they were true. So you've got to be very careful of that line and be very willing to question anything and think, well, is this just another hoax? You know, there are lots of them. Uh, they abound in the field of medicine. And they stand in the way of progress, of course. You know, if you're going to obstruct the idea that washing your hands means fewer infections, uh, you're not going to be a very good doctor. But there are people that like that. They just stubbornly stand in the way. And everybody knows that washing your hands has nothing to do with sterility and hygiene and lack of infections. There's a famous spin-off uh, 
or an important spin-off, I should say, uh, from this line of thought, which is jingos and slogans, you know, those things, the little sayings that everybody must, you know, they're enforced often by government's propaganda, advertising jingos, of course, the same thing, you know, ours is the only kind of car to drive, everything else is rubbish. And they're very pernicious, they're used to control people, they can be very destructive. You know, Hitler's famous one, you know, if you're not with us, you're against us. And if you didn't say, yes, I'm with you, and sign up, then you're just as likely to be shot as if you said, Nazism is evil and should be eradicated from the face of the earth. Uh, you know, very in, uh, in, in political enforcement on steroids, basically. Here in America, you hear often that, you know, you're not being patriotic. If you don't accept the need to spy on people and strip search people and, uh, you know, whatever, that, you know, uh, that you're somehow not patriotic because you're saying, hang on a minute, you know, the American Constitution forbids this. Oh, that's not patriotic. We need to protect ourselves against terrorists. Again, often enforcement like that. Another common snide, snotty one that you get from the New Ages and the green movement and the eco people, I'm sick of it, is saying, well, if you're not with us and not willing to help save the world, then you're uncaring in some way, you know, as if theirs was the only way of changing the world. Uh, a famous application of this kind of idea is the thing which is called a meme which is its posh word, or thought virus, which I think everybody understands now. You know, an idea that's passed from, you know, mind to mind. Like I, I used an example before, you know, all blondes are gold diggers. So if I bring up my sons to accept that, and they have it in their heads and their minds, uh, you know, blondes are gold diggers, you know, best to go for a brunette. They have been infected by a sort of thought virus from me. I think it, I think it's a good model, you know, a, th a thought virus because it does. It is like infection. It spreads from mind to mind, and you know you can you can pick it up from contamination and then it infects you, and then you can recontaminate the next person and so on. It doesn't have to come all from the same person. Lots of these around, you know, the destroy America. That's a particularly Islamic centered one. You know, Jews cause all the trouble. That was Hitler's uh, meme. Uh, Christ is Lord. Listen, I'm tired of hearing this from Christians. No, Christ is their Lord, but you know, there are many, many other peoples on earth. And I do not accept the arrogance and dogma that they're wrong because they're not Christian and don't believe in the Bible. That's rubbish. Okay, so education, of course, is based on thought viruses. Kids are supposed to pick up what's in the textbooks and chant it back. They're supposed to absorb the spiel that the teacher throws out and learn to mimic it back. And I've heard it said very wittily that actually schooling and education is just simply an advertisement for the status quo. You know, it's telling them what is because that's what we think is. And the zeitgeist, you know, this word zeitgeist, it's a, a German word. It means spirit of the times, basically. Uh, geist is the word re related to our word ghost, the spirit. So. Uh, anyway, it's the zeitgeist of the times. That, that's what kids are taught. They're taught what everyone believes to be true at the time. Uh, and it's not true and open knowledge at all. It's, you know, it's a system, a belief system. It's, it, actually, it's a licensing system. Take countries like here in the USA. You can't teach unless you've got a license. How do you get a license? Well, you learn the status quo and you learn what everybody else is spouting. And that's all you're allowed to say. And if you say anything else, you lose your license. Therefore, you can't teach anymore. Talk about a censorship system. You know, it's <laughs> all that kids have to do is pass the exams. They don't have to understand anything. They're especially trained not to even think outside the box. That is a kiss of death for a kid. You know, you can end up with infractions, end up being downgraded. You can end up being expelled, for goodness sake. And of course, all this stifles you know, freedom of thinking, discovery, that's the important word. If you think about it, science discoveries, uh, advances in knowledge. I mean, look at the whole computer revolution that took place in our lifetime. It was done by a bunch of kids, you know, Gates and uh, uh, Steve Jobs and so on, that said, to hell with you lot, they're all college dropouts, and went and did their own thing. That could not happen within the system. You know, you've got to be able to break out of the system because dogma is self-perpetuating. And it's one of the worst failings of modern, modern education, this suppression of uh, freedom of thought and also the interconnectedness. You know the f famous joke that, you know, a specialty, specialized studies, so it's a medical joke, but it applies in other sciences. A specialist is somebody who knows more and more and more about less and less and less. You know, knowledge comes down to tiny little bands. 
and there's no interaction between uh, disciplines and specialties. You know, you get a, a skin doctor who's treating a skin rash that any nutritionist could recognize, you, you know, was from Pellagra, the person has a, you know, B3 deficiency. <laughs> Just treat the B3, the rash will go away. Giving dermatographic creams is a waste of time. Uh, so, as I said, there's this pressure, you know, good studenting means being force-fed what's been rather cleverly described as a sort of the data equivalent of fast food, or as I think of it, you know, it's sort of data pornography, really, data porn, you know, it's just, it's obscene what, what's thrust at them. Uh, a great quote here, which uh, I'll just have to read for you, but intensive and narrow scientific training will guarantee that you'll never make a scientific breakthrough. We must forge a pioneering education whose purpose is to produce the imaginative generalists who can take us into the uncharted future. That's from a great book called Sparks of Genius. And that's it, the generalist. One of the criticisms of my book Virtual Medicine when it came out is they called me a generalist. You know, I wasn't taking some particular viewpoint. I was, you know, I did everything from the Big Bang downwards. Uh, through all kinds of you know scientific medical procedures to do with any energy medicine, this school, that school, the Chinese, the Indian models, you know Western technology, any energy medicine, homeopathic models. Why? Because I know all of these things and a good lot more besides, and I love them because I love the way they integrate. I can see the connections. And some narrow-minded fart in the medical profession, you know, who only knows aspirin and, uh, you know, uh, statins and things like that, can't see the connection between these things. Hey, I'm getting on my hobby horse. Let me calm down. What can we do? How can we recover from this process? Well, as I said, there's lots and lots of material uh, in the supernatics writings area. There are many courses on this that you could uh, find valuable, particularly... On study and education, we like to try and deal with this first and early on. But the first thing you can do, you can do for yourself right now, starting this moment with a decision. It's one of my sayings, every good thing starts with just a decision. It's instant. And that's to start questioning everything. Just start everything. You know, even if you've spent 60 years being told the Bible is correct, time to start questioning it. In the Bible, it tells you that adultery is okay, that murdering your best friend is okay, that giving your daughter to the neighbors to be raped is better than having them kill your son. This is all totally unacceptable to me, but it's in the Bible. So you must start to question things. Surely you're capable of questioning things like that. Now, of course, there are some texts that are relatively reliable. We've got to start entering some judgment. And I don't know, there is no absolute benchmark of what is reliable except what you for yourself test out and find to be true, right? Of course, if you find that, uh, you know, adultery and murdering your best friend works for you, fine, I think you'll end up in trouble, I'm warning you, because it doesn't work for the rest of us. But at least it would be based on your own experience, right? Whereas to just take it from some old scribblings from Jewish scholars thousands of years ago, I'm sorry, it doesn't work for me. Uh, but maybe texts in a library, you know, reliable books, Encyclopedia Britannica, for example. The modern one has got very pompous, and it has got into the dogma thing. But the very much beloved 1911 edition, it's still, as I say, beloved, even though it's over 100 years old. For example, it said things like, nobody's going to understand the properties of time and the properties of space, or what the phenomenon, I should say, that we call space until we understand the properties of mind. They're sort of mental phenomena. They're not really in physics. They're in the mind domain to a considerable extent. That was open, honest, and actually has never been improved on. You know, there isn't any definition of space in physics. Still not yet. Then, of course, you've got to be on your guard for rubbish sources. The internet is garbage. I can't tell you the amount of bunk that's out there that really exasperates me and people repeat it. You know, people come onto my website and make a comment and say, don't you know that so-and-so, blah, blah, you know, as if everybody knew. And A, it's not true, and B, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not party to it. Uh, and yet this person accepts it as gospel truth. Well, it must be true, true because I read it on the internet. And of course, TV and newspapers are famous, or infamous, I should say, notorious for the lies that they tell, the censorship and distortion, and, you know, the wrong picture that you get. You've got to question everything against your own experience, your own knowing and your own understanding, like Buddha said. 
And you've got to be careful, as I said, do not take authoritative dogma sources. I don't care if they call it the holy book. I'm not even interested. You need to take data as it comes and how it works. The Bible is not your own knowing and understanding. It's somebody else's dogma. They may feel they know it and they understand it, but for you to just read it and buy into it is a very poor standard of education. And it, to me, it would give rise to a very inferior grade of beliefs and faith, I think, you know, to just buy it on those terms, goodness me. So you cautiously test the data, you know, does it work? Can you use it? Does it apply to anything? I mean, most data is worthless if it doesn't have any application. What use is knowing the kings and queens of England, their dates and in the right sequence? None whatsoever to 99.999% of the human race and 99.9% .9 of the British people, if it comes to that. Only if you're going to be a professor of history, and who cares, there are very few of those, okay? So it's got to be useful knowledge as well. So, you know, does it fit in, do it, with things that I already know are true, for example, and I beg you to suspend your judgment until you start getting some answers to that kind of level of knowledge. You need to change certainty and dogma for a more sort of humble and inquiring attitude. These are the people that get the best results in life. You know, the people that start in doubt often work their way through and come up with something that's valuable. The people who start with certainty, often it crumbles and crumbles until they're in, in doubt. <laughs> As I said, religious pronouncements are particularly dangerous, but that's not the point. The point is, uh, you know, publishing something else by somebody else is not really a reliable source of data, and labeling it as the Word of God is, is to me, is, well, let's not go there. Uh, you've got to remember, you've got to go through with, a, I suppose, a slightly cynical attitude. You've got to remember that the world is filled almost to the brim with junk, with false knowledge, with hoaxes, traps, arbitrary scientific truths that are rubbish and later turn. You know, it was a scientific truth once that heavier, air, heavier than air machines couldn't fly, or a scientific truth that a steamship couldn't possibly carry enough coal to get across the Atlantic. And here's the important thing. I think, you know, this is, I don't want it to sound perfectionism. We need to make changes now, but ultimately I'd like to see by some mechanism or other that we can sort of draw a line in the sand under all this garbage and start teaching the next generation or generations to come up with something better. It's almost like starting again. I mean, there is knowledge out there that's worth retaining, of course. You know, how computers work, you know, software programming, your iPhones, your telephone and so on. How, listen, not just mechanical, you know, how to raise cattle, how to get healthy crops, how to grow uh, you know, nutritionally valuable food, how to get proper healing by calling in nature instead of using chemicals and drugs. There's tons and tons of wonderful and valuable knowledge out there. I, I don't want that lost. I mean, I want people to be able to decide for themselves and appraise what's true and what isn't, you know. And really the ultimate in learning is, is learning to learn. It's not really education, it's learning to learn. What I'm talking about is ability, not education. You know, learning to do things, learning to think well, learning to think straight. That's what's so valuable. And it's important. One of my lifelong sayings has been that study can save the world. Uh, you know, you can't suppress or oppress a people who's capable of learning the truth for themselves. You can't feed them lies and baloney like politicians do. If the person can go for themselves and find the truth about this, then they're not going to be moved. They're not so easily enslaved. But of course, that's why governments control education very carefully, because they want slaves. They want people to control. They want everyone to do what they're told, and they want everyone to follow their path. And freedom and learning and education terrifies them. That's why we've got this bullshit education system. Okay, well, let me tell you, in supernoetics, we have the opposite. We have a huge body of knowledge. It's test-driven and it's proven. I still want you to test drive it and prove it for yourself, but I mean, person after person after person has used this stuff and it works, you know, and uh, it's still up to you, though, to study it and get to grips with it and make it work for yourself. Integrate it with your own being. That's what we consider the most valuable gold standard of study. You can integrate it with your own being. You're not just spieling facts that come from somebody else. Uh, and learning to learn is one of the first things that we teach. 
Okay, join us and <laughs> learn more about the world around you by learning about it the right way. Thank you very much.